Hi, I'm Mark Blundell, and you're listening to Beyond the Grid. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Now, I hope you're all doing okay during these difficult times of isolation. Try to stay positive, and I hope you enjoy the next hour and a bit, because my guest this week is a terrific former racer and a great raconteur. He's a man who stood on three Formula One podiums in the 90s and is also a winner of the Le Mans 24 Hours and multiple IndyCar races. During his career, he worked with some of the best drivers in history, including Ayrton Senna, and he developed some of the most advanced tech the sport has ever known while he was test driver at Williams and McLaren. He's also the guy who, had the cards fallen differently, could have been driving the 1993 Williams instead of Damon Hill. Just think what that would have done to his career. I'm talking, of course, about Mark Blundell. Mark's Formula One story is not your average one. He was born into a family that had no real passion for car racing. As a youngster, he got his speed fix driving secondhand cars around his father's car dealership. And it was through grit, bloody mindedness and talent that he fought his way through the ranks to Formula One. It says a lot about Mark that when he got his offer to race for Brabham in 1991, he immediately telephoned his friend Damon and suggested that he take his place as the Williams test driver. And while Mark went on to struggle in an uncompetitive Brabham, Damon thrived at Williams and was to get the nod alongside Alain Prost for 1993. And the rest is history. But Mark's a fighter. Having dropped off the grid, he forced his way back into Formula One alongside his friend Martin Brundle at Ligier, And he then replaced none other than Nigel Mansell at McLaren in 1995 after a spell at Tyrrell. Mark's was a rollercoaster Grand Prix career, and we talk about everything from the realities of living on a back-of-the-grid Formula One wage while raising a young family, to his enduring friendship with Martin Brundle, and his life now as a businessman and driver manager. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Mark, welcome to Beyond the Grid. Lovely to have you on the show. Now, I want to start by asking you about the first time you drove a Formula One car. Can you just paint the scene for us? Where were you and what impact did the car have on you? You know, that's a really good question. And and I'm racking my brain now because I think the first time I sat my backside in an F1 car was at an airfield near Didcot, the Williams factory. Because that was my first foray into Formula One as a test driver for the Williams Grand Prix team. I kicked off in motor racing in Formula Ford 1600, 1984, and by 1989 was sitting in an F1 car about to become the test driver, which back then was super fast transition. Now, you know, we've got babies jumping in Formula One cars, like young Verstappen at 17 years old or something, so it's uh, it's not very novel these days, but um, it would have been then, I'm pretty sure of it, and it would have been a straightforward up and down aero test. And I think like everybody who drives an F1 car for the first time, you are blown away, not so much by the straight line performance, but by the stopping power. And that's always been the thing with with F1 for me. It's not really been that acceleration or terminal speed. It's been the stopping power, the cornering loads, and the finesse of every input having an output. And I think that's the pinnacle of motorsport is an F1 car. When you ever get to drive one, Anyone who has will relate to what I'm saying. God, the glamour of it. So it was an airfield near Didcot, near the Williams factory. It wasn't Monaco, was it? It wasn't Monaco. (laughs) I I regret to inform you there was no glamour at that time. You know, and don't forget back then, Tom, that was the first sort of role as a full-on test and development driver. You know, I was kind of like the new kid on the block and the start of a generation of, of test drivers. But very fortunate because, you know, back then I think I probably accumulated you know, 10,000 Ks in an F1 car testing during a season. And not only that, was doing some fantastic work, you know, huge amount of work with semi-automatic gearbox, active right suspension. So I was way up on all that technology, much further ahead than most of the race car drivers at the time. Now, you touched on it a minute ago. It was a very, very fast transition for you from motocross, which is what you'd done as a kid, through to Formula One, just five years. Why do you think Williams took a punt on someone so inexperienced, really? Um, I went to the Williams factory to meet Frank with a guy called John McDonald, who uh, had been a previous Formula One owner, I think with the the Ram F1 team. 
He was running a company called Middlebridge, which was a, a race team, uh, F3000. I was doing F3000 at the time and World Sports Car Championship combined programs with Nissan. I think John took me there basically to say to Frank, as a young English kid who is, in my eyes, fast, has got good feedback, can memorize lots of information, process it, you should have a test driver. And it was off the back of John's recommendation, actually, that Frank bought into it. And we negotiated a, a fee. So I was actually paid at that point. Incredibly small amount of money, I may add. But um, uh, at that stage, it was the, you know, the entry point for me into F1. And um, eternally grateful for it. And to this day, I still treasure all of those moments with Williams. And John McDonald, big mate of Bernie Ecclestone. So you were getting, you were sort of friends with the right people at that time. Well, you know, John, John's got uh, a very uh, varied background. And at the same time, you know, he's, he was from that generation. Yes, he had the likes of Bernie that he knew very, very well, Frank, you know, lots of people. But, um, you know, I don't take nothing away from the fact that actually through John's recommendation, having known me as a, as a young driver and worked with me, it helped to get me into the factory at Williams and for Frank to take notice and, and give me an opportunity, uh, which, as I say, Frank, Patrick Head, fantastic guys. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more of that story that we could get into, but, you know, eternally grateful, as I say. You were with Williams for two years and that meant you touched base with, well, obviously Patrick Head, who was the technical director, but also Adrian Newey came on board at Williams at that time. Um, what impression did they make on a young Mark Blundell? Hey, I mean, uh, I, I think just being in that environment full stop was impressionable for a young racing driver and I took everything in and and tried to absorb as much as possible. And I think, you know, when you've got the caliber of a Patrick Head, a Nui, a, a Paddy Lowe, yeah? I mean, I worked with Paddy on the, the semi-automatic and the active ride suspension side, you know, who went on to do far bigger things. But they operate at a different level. They expect a different level back. They don't take no for an answer, and they also don't take any prisoners. Yeah? So, you know, if, if you make a mistake and you screw up, you're accountable. And um, as a young guy, I mean, back then I was probably, what, 21 years old, um, quite a lot of responsibility and, and you know, and, and quite a lot of weight on your shoulders to, to deliver back into an environment, which at the time, Williams were a top Grand Prix team, you know, a Grand Prix winning team. How good were FW12 and 13, those two cars that you would have been driving at the time? Um, I mean, 13, I think, was a good car, but not a great car. In fact, my... My best ever racing car that I've ever sat in in my life would be an FW14. Oh, you got to drive that? I did. Amazing. I did. And i tell you why. Because off the back of my Williams testing, I got picked up by Brabham. Again, another story because I should have had a, a manager at that stage who should have told uh, me I, to there's stay. There's so much I want to ask you about that yeah, decision. Right. But, but, but let's talk about 14. But, but 14, I got the opportunity to drive the 14B. Uh, that's because Williams asked me to come back and test their cars even though I was a Grand Prix driver contracted to Brabham. Unheard of. Yeah, it doesn't really go on. Um, I asked Brabham. They were like, no problem. We'd love to understand what the Williams is all about. Williams were like, thank you very much. Come and do some work for us again. We'd like some evaluation, feedback. And it was at Imola. And, and we'd just done the Grand Prix at Imola. Then we did the testing afterwards. And I remember to this day going around in the FW14B 2.2 seconds faster than what I'd qualified with qualifying tires in the Brabham. And it was at that point I realized I'd made an error of judgment in going to Brabham because it just told me, you know, without any shadow of a doubt, you're only as good as what you drive. And uh, that car was mighty. I mean, it was awesome. And how much are things like the semi-automatic gearbox and, and the active ride that you'd been working on, how much did that lot come on since you'd driven it before uh, huge amounts i mean uh, massive step in 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 technology from that side of things um but again just uh, the purity of the of the package in terms of the aerodynamics it was the beginning of the blown underwing era you know where you you physically put your foot down on the throttle pedal when you felt the rear end of the car squat you know it was that effective and you know the balance on a car and and people talk about balance you know it's not 
you sit in the car and topple one way or the other. It, it is about the balance of a platform. The, you know, a car going into a corner with just those little nuances as opposed to having fundamental handling problems. And uh, FW14B was a nigh on a perfectly balanced car. I mean, it fundamentally, it was a fantastic God, car. God, how cool must that? That must have been awesome. But look, so you had a three-year testing deal with Williams, 89, 90, and 91. As you've touched on, you ended up racing for Brabham in 91. How did that deal come about? So that came about purely because of my testing pace, I would say, really. I mean, it was, you know, we were, were running around doing all of these test days back then. You know, those days you had a full-on test team. You had a very busy testing schedule. You were quite easily able to compare yourself against the drivers in the car racing. Um, so, you know, like the Thierry Boots and Ricardo Petrezzi, these guys. And I was doing, you know, a good job and, and actually sticking some lap times together that were very comparable. At sometimes, even with the active ride car, even quicker. Uh, you know, yes, we had technology uh, enhancement with the car, but it was getting back and it was getting noticed. And Brabham approached me again through John McDonald um, and a guy uh, called Dennis Nursey who was part of the uh, Japanese ownership, a guy called Koji Nakuchi, I think his name was back then. Um, yeah, we, always one that will stick in my mind. I'll never forget turning up in Tokyo with Martin Brundle and the team owner picked us up in an SD1 Rover, you know, which, <laughs> was, which was probably worth about 800 quid at the time, you know. Uh, and, and we we've were made so, it, Martin, we've made uh, it. I, I mean, we both looked at each other in astonishment, but um, we kind of like, is this guy supposed to be a billionaire or something? Or like... Oh, maybe it's a, Alarm bells ringing yeah, it's, a, it's a novelty factor. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, the, the Brabham drive came about through, through John again. And, and again, it's relationship stuff, which so often in, in F1 goes unaccounted for. But there is a lot of relationship building that goes on. But you say you didn't have a manager. Was, was John McDonald the closest thing you had to a manager? John was a, John was a guy that actually, I think, you know, we related to each other. Yeah. We probably spoke the same way. <laughs> um, and I think John could see in me someone who was hungry and could see there was a little bit of spark and I was willing to go and do the extra mile. And he would relate to that. And I think, you know, he just felt that he could you know, take a bit of a risk on me and, and was quite happy to do so. So he put me forward to Frank. Frank took me. I did a good job for them. He was then involved with Brabham, although it didn't last, but he managed to get me into a seat. Um was I thankful? Yeah, incredibly thankful. Was I thankful about sitting in Brabham on a couple of occasions because my check bounced and I didn't get paid? Not at that stage. But again, this is Formula One. This is what it's all about. You know, you look at it and you have this perception of glitz and glamour. But where we were on the grid and what was going on, it was far from it. But what were your hopes going into that 91 season with Brabham? Because you've given up the Williams testing role. Renault, obviously, at the time, you know, were the engine to have. So it was the right package, the Williams Renault. Bootson and, and Patrese were coming towards the end of their careers. Did you not think there might be an opening at Williams in the near future? Why, why the Brabham thing? I, I, you know, Am I bringing up really bad memories? No, I'm so no. Sorry. You're, you're, bringing up, you're bringing up fundamentally stuff that as a young guy with limited experience of motorsport, really, when we you know, dig down, you know, my family didn't have anything to do with, with motor racing. We, we didn't really have any you know, idea of the concept of how to go about doing it even from day one. So where did the spark come from then for, it, for, it, for racing? It came off of a, a friend of my dad who, oh, who okay. was into motor racing and started to take me as a kid watching races, the likes of a Rosberg and a Peterson, these kind of guys, you know, doing F3 and this kind of stuff. And that's where I got a passion for it. My dad then was a car trader, secondhand car dealer. As, you know, an eight-year-old sitting on cushions, driving around the forecourt, crashing cars, that's what I love doing. That's how I learned to drive. And, you know, the, the motor racing thing just, it was never even conceived of being a, a possibility. I thought um, it might have been your grandfather because didn't you have his quote, the will to win on the back of your I, lid? My grandfather, he was influential in my young life and also in my racing career in the early days while he was around. But it was always his saying of, you know, you've got to have the will to win. And again, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted that on my crash helmet. And to this day, it's been there ever since. And I would never, ever take it off. So there was that side of, but no influence from anybody with motorsport experience. So when we got to these stages of Brabham are offering you a Formula One contract, a wage, 
you're going to be on the grid, you're looking at it and going, well, I've got this testing contract. Not so sure that, you know, I'll be around testing again the following year or I'm not so sure what's going to go on with the race drivers because I didn't have anybody batting for me. I didn't have anyone in my corner that I now know doing the role I do with management of drivers that was in there at the factory and was understanding where the future contracts were, understanding whether there were strength of relationships with the management and the drivers, knowing to say to me, Mark, hang tight. We think there could be an opportunity here or we're manipulating a situation or we're massaging something. Yeah, it's all coming together for you. So just stay where you are. I didn't have that information. You just felt you had to take it. I no felt, other option almost. Yeah. I started 1984. I'm sitting in an F1 car 89 testing. 1991, I've got a contract on my desk. Do you want to be a Grand Prix driver? Uh, yeah. 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 But in hindsight, I should have sat back because, you know, here's me calling up my buddy, Damon Hill, saying, hey, Damon, I've got a drive, but hey, you should contact Frank and get yourself in my testing seat. So, do you know, Damon Hill, when he was on Beyond the Grid last year, said, I think I owe my career to Mark <laughs> Brundell. I mean, that's kind of how it played out. Is that really what happened? You, you well, flagged up the situation with Damon. <laughs> Bizarrely, it went in front of that because actually I said to him about F3000 because he went to Middlebridge as well. Yeah, and I departed. He he took on that role. He really did follow in your wheelchair. Yeah, no, no, and and it, it is not you know no word of a lie. Damon will verify it. You know, mm. I rung him, said, "Look, I'm off." No, that's exactly what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to go and speak to the guys, and yeah, he owes me a drink. He knows he owes me a drink. He's still not paid. You know? <laughs> but you know, I should have stayed. You know, if I were looking after somebody now, managing them, and I could see that situation now. I would be advising them, no, hang tight, stay there. You know, we're safe. Because I was doing a great job. The guys were, you know, very, very happy with what I was doing in the test role. I also had a situation where I would have been the driver in a third car with Williams for the extra Grand Prix that was going to get put on. So back then, there was a lot of discussion about running an extra Grand Prix, which I think was going to be at Donington. Um, it was going to be like a, an unofficial world championship race, but they were going to try and hold it. And I was earmarked to drive the active ride car with Boots and Patrese in a passive cars. And again, it just slipped by me, it didn't happen. You know? But all these things may have happened. It probably would have given me the wares to show what I could do. Maybe things would have been different. Maybe I would have sat as world champion and not Damon, but there you go. Well, no, here's the thing. I don't want you to slap me, but I mean, do you wake up in the middle of the night thinking that could have been me? Because it really could have been you by the sounds of it. Uh, Tom, listen, I don't, I don't wake up like that. You know, I, I'm not bitter. I'm not anything because I am... A kid who came out of Barnet, North London, no education. I've got to be an F1 driver. I can sit my grandchildren on my, on my knee and talk about all these stories when they get older and show them some photographs. I'm proud, but I'm not bitter. You know? But what it taught me was understanding the business of F1, and it is a business. The sport is related there somewhere, but at you know, the, the end of the day, it's a business. And it, it, it told me how important relationships were. And it also told me about, you know, delivery at the right time. And when you deliver, you've got to make sure that you maximize that opportunity. You know, and at points in my career, I learned huge amounts. You know, further on down the line, I learned from other people in different areas. Maybe that's why it's given me something to work from in a different context now in the sport. But I'm not bitter, no. I'm, and I'm proud of people like Damon and stuff. Me and those guys raced against each other. And we all came up through the ranks together. And probably as a group of drivers... We probably have to check, but I'm sure it's the biggest crop of guys that made it in one hit into F1. You know, collectively, if you looked at all of us, you know, was, there were great times. The Brit Pack. But can you remember where you were, how you, when Damon was announced as a night, the, the Williams driver alongside Alan Prost for 93? I mean, is it one of those, one of your, the, the most painful memories? I, no, I mean, not, not painful. I mean, obviously, you, you know, yeah, there's a reflection of, oh, it could have been me. And like, and, and, in, and in some ways, I probably was looking at it, oh, it should have been me. You know, but it, it, it couldn't have been me and it shouldn't have been me because I made the wrong decisions at the time. That's, that's the simple way of looking at it. Uh, and, you know, I can look back and say I didn't have anybody around me. You know, even I go back to my dad, who I, I, I respected and admired, and he was a very smart business guy. But we just didn't have the, the inner workings of, of motor racing and we didn't quite understand the, you know, the dynamics of it. If we'd have had somebody who was inside, I think they would have probably given me a little bit of a heads up and go, hey, just, just sit tight. And my decision would have been made off the back of it. As it was, decision was made off looking at a Formula One contract with Brabham. Salaried, 
and in my eyes and and my family, oh, you've made it. You've got to where you are, and you know the dream's going to come true. What was the Brabham like to drive? The Brabham Yamaha. Oh my god, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> don't, uh, don't forget, we, uh, we started with a BT59 for a start because a new car wasn't ready. Um, I think we, I think Phoenix Grand Prix, we could only run four out of the five gears because the fifth gear wouldn't fit in the gearbox. I mean, there was all sorts of problems. The 60 we had, we sat in the, the wooden buck back then that you used to go in and do the seat fit originally and try and get the idea of, of uh, ergonomics and cockpit size. They then produced a car, full carbon monocoque. Both myself and Martin got into the monocoque and discovered that they built the bulkhead too big and you couldn't raise your knees past and couldn't get out of the car. So you couldn't do the exit, you know, the, the process under five seconds, whatever it was back then. But, you know, so they had to take a grinder and start cutting carbon away, of which was then rigidity and strength and all sorts of problems. But again, that was, that was what it was like back then. It was still a bit hit and miss. Um, but no, it was a terrible car. As I say, and the, and the FW14 Williams test verified that. Yeah. You know, you can imagine rolling down pit lane, yeah. knowing that what you're driving, you know, is not tenths away, it's seconds away. You know, and then you, you go and jump into somebody else's car that you're actually racing against, and you go that much quicker, and you go, well, it, it, it's an uphill struggle. Was it almost a relief to get out of that situation at the end of 91? It was a relief in many ways because, you know, there was all this, you know, don't forget, at this stage... I'm a young guy still. I'm also a father. I have my first child. A lot of responsibility. And I think a lot of people sort of don't quite realize this. You know, is a lot of drivers are on a career path and single or they don't have the responsibilities of having a child. You know, I was already a dad. So I'm trying to build an international career, be responsible and earn a living for my family. And, and at the same time, you know, all the stresses and strains and pressures. And in some ways, maybe that was also one of the decisions that came into me going to Brabham. I've got to earn some money I've to got put to earn some bread money. on the table. Exactly. Of. Exactly. So it doesn't make you slower having a kid, but it might influence the decisions you make because you've got to earn a living. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that did come into it. There's no two ways about it. And in some ways, I think it probably made me even more hungry because I just had to go after whatever I could but again, it was not having anybody around me to give me any more of that guidance, which would have been so willingly accepted back then. But, you know, Brabham was a tough period because I sat alongside Martin. You know, Martin Brundle was a very established guy. So your comparison was there. I did okay. I scored the fir first world championship point for the Yamaha Motor Company um, during that season. It was tough in a way that, as I said, on two occasions, I sat inside the factory for a whole day at a time because they bounced a check on me. So no salary. And I think my whole salary came to, I think I got 110,000 pounds. But out of that, I had to take all of my travel to travel around the world, plus get insurance. Okay, it sounds a big number back then, but actually it was a very, very small number. By the time you pay to go around the world, and I wasn't traveling first class, I mean, I was in the back of the bus. Yeah, Martin was in the front of the bus. That's another story, actually. I took his first class seat. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but, but, um, but well, you know, what, what did Brundle <laughs> say to you? Because when did you first become mates with Martin? Was it when in sports cars? The it was in sports cars, the World Sports Car Championship, because obviously, you know, Blundell, Brundle, Martin, Mark, East Anglia, both in the same area. Blundell twins, weren't you? Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brundle, Schmundle, <laughs> whatever you want to say. You know, um, why it was, did it click so well? Why did you guys? Because we come from the same background in, in many ways. Mm. Uh, our fathers were both car dealers, garage owners, uh, a love of cars. Martin is very different to me in that he, uh, university education, very smart individual. I mean, very smart man. He's probably a bit more calculated, a bit more conservative than me. I'm a little bit more gung-ho and like, yeah, let's, let's go for it and see whether we can make something work. You know, and we've been in business together. You know, we, we had two MBA sports management company, but we, we just, we click, you know, we, we get on very well. Um, we're incredibly open with each other and straightforward talking with each other. So throughout that 91 season? Yeah, throughout 91, we formed a, you know, we, we knew each other and respected each other beforehand. At times it worked in my favor. I remember crashing the Williams testing and the local uh, headlines in the East Anglian papers were Brundle crashes Williams. So that was great. <laughs> Um, the local rag. 
<laughs> you know, as I said to you, I, I took his first class aircraft seat once because in Japanese, Brundle and Blundell are spelt the same. R and L in Japanese characters are the same character. So when you go M, our surname, on a boarding card, it's the same. So I took, I think, <laughs> Japan to Australia, I took his seat. He was never pleased about that and <laughs> never fantastic. forgets it. Um, but no, we, we have a, a great relationship. Um, and one that's carried on throughout in teammates at Ligier, uh, working together at ITV Formula One for seven and a half years when I was there, uh, having a business together. So, yeah. Do you ever wish you could learn a new language, but you're apprehensive about how difficult it might be? Or perhaps you feel you don't have the time to do it in your already overloaded schedule. Well, Babbel might be exactly what you need. I can speak some French, and I even tried interviewing French F1 star Olivier Panis in his mother tongue back in the day. But I've forgotten it all since then, and I'm certainly not fluent by any means. But Babbel is available as an app or accessible online and is on hand to help you and me learn a new language or simply to brush up on your linguistic skills in a matter of weeks. And it's so simple to use. You can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian and German. And what's really refreshing is that Babbel teaches real life conversation. You can learn through interactive dialogues and their speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent in your chosen language. You can start out as a newcomer mastering the basics and graduate up to an advanced level on your learning journey. The lessons are created by more than 100 real life language experts, which adds that personal touch. And it doesn't matter whether you complete your lesson online one day and via the app the next, because your progress will be synced across all devices, so you can fit your learning into your lifestyle. Babbel is designed to get you speaking your new language within weeks, with daily 10-15 to 15 minute lessons. That's all it takes, a little dedication every day. So try Babbel today. Go to babbel.co.uk or download the app for free. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot co.uk or download the app for free. Babble, learn a new language and make it your own. Right, let's get back to Mark. So you got pole position at Le Mans in 1990, and I think you were six, have I got this right, six seconds faster? Uh, just over six seconds faster, yeah, I think. Than I th anybody, I mean, what I a lap. Think that was back still, in the day when it was the, the Mulsanne was... Uh, we had the, we had the uh, chicanes the first time that year. Okay. So the chicanes had gone into the Mulsanne, and even with the chicanes in, I did 238 miles an hour on the Molson straight with the chicanes in. The thing was a hand grenade. It was a, it was a, the most reactive lap I've ever done in my life. At night? Yeah, well, dusk. You know, the, the twilight zone. Just what you want. Um, and I still say to this day, if I'd have had proper tyres on, because they were the hardest tyre we had, because we couldn't get the car to run, and I've had proper tyres, a little bit of traffic that hit me at Porsche curves, I'm pretty sure I could have done nine seconds quicker. You know, because I, that lap was exploratory lap. I'd never driven a car in anger with 1,100 horsepower. What you saw is what you got. I think there's a, there's a trend here. that as We've discussed it already, how you came through very quickly from, from motocross to Formula 1. The more grunt you had under your right foot, the more Mark Blundell seemed to react and go f better. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Hey, I th I, you, so give him 1,100 horsepower in it at Le Mans, and he's going to be, well, as he was, unbeatable. I think, I, I think it was a little bit of a case of motocross was a great grounding because no lap is the same. You're always looking for the ultimate line because that line is changing because of the terrain. And that was quite noticeable. When I jumped from motocross into Formula 4 1600, my lines in the wet were very different to most. A lot of the guys would still take the conventional racing line. I was going into a corner and I'd right angle it, shortcut, you know, almost stop, start again. And people would be like, Whoa. So we're like I'm going for the highest spot which is the driest spot where I can get some traction, turn in, squirt off the corner like a motocross bike. That's how I looked at a circuit. And I was used to having 36 competitors on a lineup in motocross and going elbow to elbow into turn one. So nothing kind of phased me with going into turn one with a guy next to me at 120 miles an hour. So you, wasn't, you don't wasn't think the lack of karting penalised you because you were doing that and motocross is all balance as well, isn't it? It's completely balance. And, you know, and balance is needed inside a race car as well. Um, no, I don't, I don't think, you know, Damon didn't do karting. He did road racing on bikes. Uh, several people have not gone through. Martin Brundle did grass track. Yeah. I don't think karting is the be all and end all. I think it's great for racecraft, but in terms of 
if a guy can, you know, a girl can drive a car fast, you can drive a car fast. That's, that's just an ability that you've got. Now, in case anyone listening to this is wondering why I'm suddenly talking to you about Le Mans 1990, I was thinking, because that was the Nissan and you got that pole position, is that what put you on the map in Japan and ultimately led to the Brabham Drive, which was owned by a Japanese businessman? Uh, I, I think there's, there's some consideration there. Um, I mean, it was the first Japanese manufacturer to ever be on pole position. To this day, I still believe it's the biggest margin ever. I don't think there's been a bigger margin from pole to second. And it, and it did kind of go, you know, I, we say the word viral today. It's like a very well used word. But back then, I think it went viral in terms of like everybody got to see it in Japan. It was sort of a national media event. So there may have been some element of being a supportive sort of decision making process for the year after with Brabham. But, you know, I, I actually was due and I had heads of agreement drawn up and a verbal deal agreed with Tom Walkinshaw to go to Jaguar. So that was the program that I was actually scheduled to run for the 1991 season. And what actually happened is that Tom then sent me the final draft of the contract and it had some fiscal areas that were removed from what we had agreed verbally. And I basically backed it on him and said, like, that's not what we agreed. And in this period of time, the Brabham opportunity came along. So that is the story behind it. Oh, fantastic. So, and what goes around comes around because, of course, you come into contact with Walkinshaw in Formula One a bit later. But how did Brundle in 92 end up in a Benetton and you were forced to go back testing? He's a lot smarter than me. <laughs> no, I think, again, listen, you know, Martin was already an established Grand Prix driver. And with a great track record, he was the only guy that really took it to center in F3. You know, he, he, he's a talent. There's no two ways about that. But I think, again, there were some relationships behind the scenes that he was, you know, he was a strong friend of Tom Walkinshaw. And Walkinshaw, that was the link that got him. Yeah. That was, you know, and again, they, they, you know, these, these kind of relationships are, there's, there's always going to be some emotional heartstrings that get pulled at some stage. And, and some people need help. And, you know, whether it's a case of a driver getting to a certain level and going, hey, engineer or designer, like, let me now bring you into the fold, you know, a bit of payback. It, it happens. Um, maybe more back then than now, but it, it, it definitely did happen. Briatore, Flavio Briatore said that Martin is the only teammate who properly worried Schumacher at Benetton. I, I, and I don't disagree. Mm. And, you know, and Martin is one of those guys who should have won a lot of Grand Prix. Definitely had the ability, definitely had the speed. Um, incredibly good outside of the car. Uh, way better at politics than me. Uh, and at the same time, you know, a very, very smart individual. And I, and I you know, I've, le I've learned a huge amount from Martin. No two ways about that. You know, listen, I, I got to the end of the Brabham season and... My calling card then was Joe Ramirez coming to see me in Australia saying, Ron Dennis wants to see you. And that was the next stage. And one then, I, because of Brabham, because of the mistake I made at Williams walking away from a three-year contract and jumping into a, a Grand Prix car that was not competitive, I then decided to sort of look at things differently. And actually, you know, it would be better for me to be associated and learning more with a top-line Grand Prix team, working with Senna and Berger, and do another year out testing. And that's where I went from there. How persuasive was Ron Dennis? Incredibly, incredibly persuasive because that was the, uh, you know, that, that was the guy that you were dealing with there that set the scene so well, told you what the benefits were going to be. You still as a young driver, you know, and still to a certain extent, relatively inexperienced because of the fast track. Although hugely experienced in terms of Formula One mileage, with all of those late technology platforms. And Ron knew that. And, and he Ron, wanted a slice of your experience of what you'd learned at Williams. And, yeah. yeah, because he, he knew that I had all this information mm. and, and understanding of what Active Ride was all about, semi-automatic gearbox. And 1992, I did you know, more miles than most in semi-automatic McLaren and semi-automatic gearbox cars. I mean, it, you know, I did a huge amount of testing. And, you know, Ron is a visionary and had visions at every level and could understand what he needed to put in place to enhance his team. And taking me from Brabham, having now had a year of experience as a Grand Prix driver and making me reserve and development driver, I was very happy with it. 
he was happy. And I think fundamentally the team were happy as well. How did McLaren and Williams differ at the time? <laughs> Very, a different atmosphere? Uh, uh, attention to detail. Attention to detail. McLaren was just one notch above in every area, whether it be from a cappuccino in the motorhome to, you know, the factory, the, the setup of the testing. Not to say that it made a difference to performance, but it, it made a difference in you kind of had your chest out a little bit and your chin up. It gave you an air of confidence that, you know, hey, we, we are number one. You know, we, we are McLaren. And that is kind of the, the DNA of McLaren back then. It was it was very apparent. And Williams is a little bit like, you know, just, I'm not saying rough and ready, but it was like, it was almost sort of pure engineering and like, let's get on with it, you know, as opposed to like the little polishing edges that made a slight difference. But I'm not saying a slight difference in that performance area, more of a of a confidence level. And... How much of a lure was the prospect of working with Ed and Senna? In particular, Gerhard Berger as well, but particularly Ed and Senna. Ah, because of those early days and that decision-making process, there was a stage then that I looked at it and said, I, I, I can learn more. And if I'm going to learn more, I should learn from the best. So why don't I go to the best Grand Prix team? Why don't I learn from the, you know, undoubtedly one of the best Grand Prix drivers ever to live? And... You know, I remember doing my first test at Silverstone. It was very early on in the year. And back then, Senna used to sort of go away for the off-season. He'd kind of leave and you wouldn't see him. He'd go recuperate and get fit again. And he kind of turned up unannounced. Unannounced to me anyway. Uh, I'm pretty sure the team knew. And I were in the garage and I rolled back in after doing some laps. And it must be like mid-morning or something. And he was there. And he had a set of headphones on. And he was basically listening in on my feedback. And listening, listening, listening. I jumped out, got to meet him. He asked me a few questions. And then he went. And I talked to one of the guys, actually. I think one of the engineers at the time. I think it may have even been Steve Hallam. And uh, I said, well, what was all that about? He said, well, I think you'll find he was actually just checking in on you. Because he understands how important the role is that you're going to be doing. Because back then, again, it was, you know, big development, big, big steps that were being taken We'd be testing on a Wednesday or Thursday, go into production and be flown out on a Saturday and fit to the car for a Sunday. Those things happened then. And I think Senna was like verifying that the guy in the cockpit is good enough to get the job done. You know, I've listened in. I'm happy with what he's saying. I relate to it and I correlate it. Off you go. Tick. It's like being verified. Got the royal seal of approval on this, right? That's, and what what made him so special inside the cockpit? Did you I mean looking at his data, looking at his feedback? I mean, he had a, he had an incredibly incredibly sensitive feel for a car. You could tell that and listen in on on you know and changes made. He'd pick up on them. Bizarrely, we we ran the same setup, so my car was the same as a Senna setup. But Berger was completely different. Berger ran his thing on the nose. You know, the thing would just be pitched in it throw the car in grab a handful of lock myself and senna was actually would sit the thing on the back side and we'd modulate the throttle so i was no different i drive in the same way as senna with like three stabs on the throttle pedal you do all that flipping yeah on the yeah, throttle coming and, through the <clears throat> yeah and you know you know who first gave me an insight into that was uh jenks jenkinson the, the, Dennis the, Jenkinson, the, yeah the, the journo steam journalist yeah. who watched me at, I think it was Vallelunga in, in Formula 3000 when I was running my own little team in 1987. And he, he came to see me in a paddock and uh, he said, well, you, you, uh, you modulate the throttle quite a lot. He said, well, why do you do that? I said, well, I, I do because I, I, I like to feel the platform of my car getting in balance before I go to the next stage of power. He said, and, that, and that's how I drive a car. And I said, some of it comes off the back of me riding a motocross bike that you go in stages of, yeah. And I said, that's, that's how I drive a car. And that's how I set a car up. It was even relevant to the days when I was doing stuff in IndyCar. I'd, I'd set my car up even on ovals in a bit of a different way to my teammates, which was crap for qualifying because it wasn't that quick. But in a race, it was actually very drivable. Um, so there was a comparison there. And it, and it also helped in my testing role that my style was very similar. So there was benefits in that. 
And what about your relationship with Senna going forward after 92? Was he aloof and didn't really talk to anyone or did you feel you had a relationship? No, with I, had a, I had a relationship. I mean, I was going to all the Grand Prix as the uh, reserve and, and development driver. So, you know, I was part of the team. I had a relationship with him, got to know him, not, you know, intimately, but got to spend quite a bit of time. Um, I remember testing at Imola. I was in the active ride suspension car. I'd actually done a lap time that was like a little bit quicker than him in a passive car. He's pouring over the data, analyzing it. And at this point, I was due to go back to the airport and Joseph Libra, the, uh, the physio, Joseph's supposed to be taking me back. And we're all in the, uh, the room doing a debrief and I go, right, okay, guys, I need to go to the airport now, back to Bologna, I think it was. And uh, Joseph, can you now take me back? And Senna just lifted his head up and looked at me and went, nope, he stays here. And this was, you know, Dave Ryan and there's all these guys were in the, in the debrief and nobody said anything. And he's like, well, you know, and there's little old me like, well, uh, how do I get to the airport then? I, and Joseph's supposed to be taking me. It's all arranged. He just looked again. He goes, no, no, no. He stays here. And it was a bit of psychology. It was a little bit of telling me, get back in your box. You've done what you've done today on the track. Yeah. But you are the test driver. You are the reserve guy. Just go sort yourself out. You're not taking any of the guys around me. You know, and it, it, it was it? it was it was part of something that I understood and in, in how he worked, because if you if you look at him, he managed to get the most out of people around him. You know, he had this he had this way of describing something and putting pressure into a system without somebody actually working out that there was pressure going in until it was like, oh, I, actually, I've just realised what he's saying. He used to do it in the press, yeah. And there was another time I sat next to him on a plane, and he had uh, Patrice who used to do his PR. She'd handed him a load of these big folders and, you know, a wad of paper. And it was all global press cuttings, like photocopies with highlighter pens. And he's pouring through it. And I'm like, you know, what are you doing? And he said, these are comments that are all negative towards me. He says, and I want to understand who's saying it. And I'm thinking to myself, like, that's a, you know, that's another level above where I am. And for what reason does he need that? And, and how does he have that capacity to take on all of that as well as worry about what he's doing? That was a difference. That was a difference between where he sat and what he achieved. So, yeah, okay, I was in 2% club. He was in, you know, beyond the 1% club. Best driver you ever had anything to do with? Um, best driver, yeah, I mean, Best racing driver on Sunday afternoon for me, because I've raced against him and been in an environment with him, would still be Senna. Somebody who I thought was ultra fast was Hakkinen. I want to come on to Mika. Yeah. Uber fast. Um, but, you know, Senna was, he was one of those, you know, borderline crazy, borderline genius. But w what he was, was incredibly selfish selfish for the own reasons of making sure that he got what he wanted and being successful and <clears throat> for me i think that was probably one of my biggest weaknesses i hadn't realized how selfish i needed to be to get what i needed to go forward and it just wasn't in my makeup but does that take us back to mark blundell parent you come home and you've got little children vomiting on your shoulder and things like that you can't be selfish when you have children. I, I, I think maybe well, there was can, a, but it doesn't yeah, great. I think maybe there was an element of that I think maybe yeah. you know culturally as well you know and also you know, don't get me wrong as well Tom, I, I think it, I do think it's quite difficult for a British driver to function inside a British team that's uh, an interesting point why yeah, because I I think it's easy to get a little bit of complacency it's easy to take the cultural background and perception and people to make you know a little bit of an assessment on somebody because you all come from the same environment, so to speak. Whereas if you've got somebody foreign who comes in, they've got that little bit of language barrier. They've got that little bit of, how can you put it, that little bit of stardust. Because they don't quite relate, it kind of sets them apart. I always said I would have been much better off being a Blundelli or a Blundello, you know? How interesting. And did you feel that when you went to Ligia? You were in a French team, the Brit coming in. A little bit of a language barrier, I'm guessing, and, and, and it made you a bit different. 100%. 100%. And I was the first British driver ever to be signed to Ligier. You know, a French team with mainly government sponsors. And 
It's so, mad. How did two Brits, you and Brundle, end up in... Well, I mean, because of Tom Wilkinshaw and Flavio Briatore, I guess. But it was an extra- well, <laughs> extraordinary actually my, uh, signing. Yeah, my, mine was driven more off the back of uh, Renault with knowing me from Williams and uh, Duke Rouge, Gerard Duke Rouge and, and, having a, and Frank Derny and as opposed to Tom and Flavio. That was more with Martin's side. And again, it was off the back of my, my testing performances with McLaren. And also the one race of the year that I did in 1992, because I, you know, I had a 100% record that year. Of course. And that was in a French team. In a French team. Winning Le Mans. Winning Le Mans with Peugeot. Peugeot. Yeah. Yeah. So there was all these little things then that went on. But it, it, it did, and that's why I just made the comments here. It struck me that I turned up at Ligier. I could not speak, you know, listen, I didn't go to school, let alone learn French. Did you, know? you try and learn French oh, in 93? No, you? no, no, you're joking. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and, it's, and it's the biggest regret of my life that I didn't knuckle down and do an education where I actually learned some languages because it would have stood me in good stead in Formula One, yeah? And bizarrely now I tell my drivers today, make sure you do your education. <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it dawned on me that I've, I've come into this team and when I speak, everybody takes notice. You know, it, and, and, I, and I reflected back on that thinking, you know, well, I've seen that, like when Berger spoke and when Senna spoke, everyone took notice because there was this little bit of magic dust and this little barrier that, you know, they had to like dial in and pick up on the little explanations and, and it was no different with me. And, you know, Martin was different in that he spoke French, probably why he ended up staying and I didn't. Um, but it, it really did strike me that it was quite apparent, the differences. Was this 93 season your happiest time? Certainly in Formula One, but almost as a, as in your career as a racing driver? Um, Two podiums, yeah, quick I car, think, proper engine, mate in the other car, Martin Brundle. I think it was a great year in many ways because lucky again that Martin and me were teammates. We, we shared travel together and, you know, the car was a very good car. We had the Williams rear end, drivetrain rear suspension you know it, it, overall it was it was a, a a pretty strong package Renault engine was outstanding and as I say it gave me an air of confidence that inside the team I spoke they listened and it felt you know it felt good but I kind of got on well with the guys and you know I think because we came out of the box pretty quick and at the same time we ended up with the podium in South Africa and first race of the year first race Amazing. of the year yeah yeah um, I mean, the first have you, podium. But you got that picture on your wall. It's I you, have. Senna, and Prost on that podium. You know, <laughs> do, you, you, do you know what, Tom? I've, I've, I've had three podiums, and every podium is either with world champions or world champions to be. Yeah. I'm the only one that didn't make anything of it, you know. <laughs> but um, it's a great picture. I, I do have that picture on my wall, actually, in the office, and uh, one that is, has got good memories. But that result was fantastic because it was the biggest result of, of Ligier for a long, long, long time. And I think there was a, a huge amount of, uh, of parting afterwards. I know that uh, Duke Rouge was uh, cutting the tops of champagne bottles off with a sabre and stuff like that. I mean, we had, a, we had a great time. We enjoyed it. But overall, that season was, was a healthy one. It was, a, it was a healthy one. And a great race in Germany as well. Great dice with Gerhard Berger on your way to the podium again. Yeah. Yeah. And... And again, I think it showed it showed Mark Blundell at his best as the racer. You know, come Sunday afternoon, I was quite happy to go toe to toe with someone. I think that that bit of footage is still great footage. I, I watch it now and again, and I still look at it and go, "Yeah, okay, hats off." And, and respectful between me and Berger. I mean, we gave each other some space, just enough. But you know, we were doing two hundred and fifteen miles an hour. Um, and with low downforce and lively cars, they weren't the easiest things to drive around. They were a handful. You know, come the end of the season, the politics are starting to get a bit heavier. The ownership change, not speaking French, actually started to go against me. Things were starting to go the wrong way. And my character, the little bit of rebellious Mark, the, the kid who came out of, you know, North London with a sort of like a little bit of, right, if, if, you, if I can't get what I want, I'm going to knock the stuffing out of you, didn't actually quite work. I needed to be a little bit more resourceful, bit more finesse, bit more sort of like practical in my outlook and trying to go to the next step in my career. 
Um, but did it feel quite sickening to feel the politics of a situation taking over again? Yeah, I, I, but I think, you know, that's, again, that, I always said it, it's one thing getting there, it's another thing staying there. And, and the politics, they're always going to be there, you know, as we're seeing even today, politics and F1, that's part and parcel. But when you're in an environment like that and actually there's things that are beyond your control and, you know, and don't forget, we, back then we had Ligier with many, many sponsors were owned by the French government. You know, and there was a lot of backlash. Why are they not having a French driver in the team? Why are we supporting two roast beefs? You know, <laughs> what, what's French money going into these guys for? It was a huge amount. I mean, Guy Ligier was there at the beginning of it. Then we went to Cyril de Roof and there was a lot of issues with that kind of transfer and transitional. And, you know, yeah, it just didn't work out. Um, so what was going on track was good. Performance was good. I was doing the best I could, but circumstances beyond my control. The old cliche. Couldn't, couldn't do nothing Did it with affect it. your relationship with Brundle? Your, no. break, your breakdown in relations with the team, did that affect? No, not really. Martin. No, I mean, me and Martin knew each other well enough. Mm. Um and as I say, it, it just, it just again gave me one of those experiences of marking it down to experience, full stop, and learning from it. And all this must make you a bloody good manager <laughs> well, <laughs> in your role today, because all this life experience. I remember Josh Verstappen on this podcast saying last year that actually his F1 career was a fact-finding mission to create the perfect driver in Max Verstappen today. He's used his experience to do that, and I guess you're doing that. Now with Callum Eilert and all the other guys on the yeah, books. Yeah, I mean, you know, Gary Paffett and Mike Conway have managed them for nearly 15 years. Yeah, um, I, I always said that, you know, motor racing and, and, and Formula One and, and high levels was a great grounding for people, for young individuals to actually pick up business. Because as I said to you, it is business. You know, and when you're in the, 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 the cutting and, you know, the, the wheeling and dealing environment and you're dealing with big sponsors, big corporates, you're dealing with team principals, the likes of a Ron Dennis or a Frank Williams, you're dealing with manufacturers. You know, these are, these are incredibly intelligent people and, and, and smart individuals. And, you know, you, you, you learn a huge amount. You know, the basics of Ron Dennis, we'll never forget. You know, if you're going to do a contract, make sure you're the one who generates it. Because if you generate the contract, yes, it will cost you fiscally, but, 99% of the time you're going to have the upper hand because you're always going to get across a little bit more than what the other side would normally take. Who did the McLaren contract? Oh, it was McLaren. <laughs> you <know? clears throat> but, you know, the, 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 those little words of wisdom were things that have stuck with me. And, you know, to this day, if we can, we will always try and generate the contract from our side because you tend to come out of it a little bit more favorably. Yeah. You know, if you're driving seat and you take it forward, nine times out of 10, you get to where you want to go first. So you end up at Tyrrell following season, 94, was there anything else on the table? Because it had been a good year, 93. Um, were there other offers on the table? Or was it Tyrrell or you're going to have to look elsewhere um, outside Formula 1? Actually, there was, there was a deal floating around with, uh, with Arrows that was early on in those stages that I didn't, didn't really get. And that fell over because actually the, we were in discussions with a sponsor, of which I'd taken there and then... Somehow or another, I never got to get the deal done, but bizarrely, the sponsor turned up on the car. Who uh, owned Arrows at the time? Was that still Jackie Oliver? Or yeah. Was still Jackie? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, you know, <laughs> all these things. Yeah. You know? um, but no, uh, so Tyrrell, <clears throat> Ken Tyrrell, uh, Ken Tyrrell approached um, with Harvey Possaway. Um Two legends. Mike Gascoigne was there as well. Of course. And, you know, to, to I, I talked to, to Martin about Ken and uh, he just said to me, look, you know, he, he's just a, a, an incredible individual. And if the opportunity is there, you got to you got to go for it. And to be fair, at the end of the day, it was probably the only opportunity I had, again, salaried, where I would be taking a wage home to my young family uh, and still being a Formula One driver. So, you know, that's the route I took. The driving force behind it also was Yamaha because, again, I'd scored the first world championship point in Formula One with Brabham. I had a good working relationship with them. We had a, a, a nice mutual relationship and they had come into the Tyrrell situation as engine supplier and were very supportive of me being one of the drivers. It's extraordinary, isn't it? What goes around comes around in Formula One and, and the loyalty as well. I mean, the Fernando Alonso school of 
you know, GP2 engines, whatever else he accused Honda of. I mean, it's a classic example of how not to do it. Whereas the Mark Blundell school of, I mean, who would have thought after that 91 season, which, okay, you got their first point, but it wasn't a great season that they would have been instrumental in you driving for them again. Yeah. I've, yeah listen, I think, uh, and again, a little bit of reflection on that, that comment I made about not being selfish enough in some ways, you know, I didn't have that ruthless streak in me, but what was in me that everywhere in my career I've been, I can walk back through the doors. There's not a problem. Did did that mean or does that mean that I left something on the table? Probably. I could what probably, do you mean? Well, because I probably think that there's times during my career where I should have been, you know what? No, I'm going to do that or I'm going to make this happen. Or actually, I'm going to do something here that's going to affect something else, but it's going to be for my benefit. And I probably should have made some of those decisions to ultimately get me bigger rewards, bigger success on track. And I didn't do it. And not just in Formula One, in, in, in America as well. And, and loyalty was the overriding factor. Uh, but that's, that's me. That, that's my principles. That's how I got brought up. That's what I've always stuck to. And as I say, that's what I hope and still today gives me opportunity to walk back through doors wherever I've been and still welcomed with a hello and how you getting on. And, you know, not everybody can say that. And I guess that's how you ended up back at McLaren as well, back in 95, because of the relationship you built up there in, in 92. But before we get on to that, um, Harvey Pothelswaite, you've worked with Patrick Head, you've worked with Adrian Newey. Uh, Steve Nichols at McLaren, etc. Harvey, God bless his soul, what a, an amazing engineer. How, I mean, Mike Gascoigne, you mentioned him, can't praise Harvey enough. Is that is that where you are in terms of working with him? Yeah, Harvey was Harvey was one of those guys, um, you know, a, a, a little bit in the, in the same mould as, as Patrick Head. He he was a... Quite old school. Or, um, I don't mean that in not, a derogatory way, but not so. No, I wouldn't say not so much old school, because bearing in mind back then they were not. You know, they were still young guys to a certain point. Uh, um, no, I would say racers, table thumpers. You know, let's rally the troops. Let's make this happen. This like yeah, come on, let's let's go deliver. Let's get it done. And why can't it be done? There's no such word as can't let's let's get let's get on and get it done harvey had that you know it was it was a how can i put it when you were in an environment with him people fed off of him and it, and it, it motivated people and it, and it gave you he was always pushing boundaries even in a small team like Tyrrell, obviously when he was at Ferrari, he had huge resource to do whatever he wanted but that was still the attitude at he, he, even more so i think because you know you had to try and make those marginal gains on on actually pretty much nothing, you know, because we struggled for budget. We, you know, we, and yeah, it's like, I went off in, uh, I went off at Monza, a brake failure. It wasn't because we had a failure with the brakes, it's because actually the brakes were worn out and the disc exploded. You know, we didn't have enough budget to put new brakes on. You know, those are the kind of things that happened. And if we'd have had proper budget behind us, it would never have happened counterproductive because it cost us a huge amount more in damage but you know that that's the kind of thing that you were getting into um i think you know harvey was also one of those guys like like a, a patrick that he understood the human element he understood how to get the most out of the human factor so in, including racing drivers exactly that like a patrick head you know, and and the drivers could relate to them because there was there was that little bit of connectivity. Really interesting to hear you say because wasn't Patrick Head that there was that famous quote: "Drivers are like light bulbs; you can just take one out and put another one in." And yet you say you actually fed off that. Yeah, but I've, <clears throat> you know, I I think there's I think there's that little bit of pressure in the system that drivers are fully aware that that's you know they are an expensable asset. You know, as in they can be plugged in and out, but you kind of like. If you can't cope with that pressure, you're really in the wrong job. So to a degree, there was a little bit of that always going to be above your head with that pressure of bearing down on you. But those guys also knew how to extract the most out of the individual. You know, and, and, and I, I related to it because I had a huge amount of respect for those guys. And, and I would feed off of it. Maybe some people didn't. I don't know. 
not to say it was like, you know, a God-given process that worked in all, all ways with all people. But for me, kind of, you know, if I'm going to give my all and I'm, and I'm with you. Let's, let's try and get something out of this that at the moment we can't achieve. And how good then was that 94 Tyrrell? Okay, it had the Yamaha engine. I'm guessing that wasn't as good as the Renault that you'd had the previous year, but you still managed to get that podium in Spain. And- yeah, I mean, listen, I think it was a good little car. It wasn't It wasn't a bad little car by any means. I think engine-wise, you know, as much as I love the guys at Yamaha, I think it probably was behind the eight ball in performance and weight and dimensional size for packaging. So, you know, you, you jump from a Renault-powered car, which was just 2,000 RPM and linear when you got in the throttle and, you know, just, just a different kettle of fish. Yamaha was kind of like, you know, light switch on off. Um, <clears throat> and all these things are, uh, affect the balance of a car. I mean, you know, when, you, when you've got something that delivers power in chunks as opposed to delivering it in smoothness, you know, it's, it's the basic terms of smooth peanut butter and crunchy, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it really is that, you know. And, and, and that's what, you know, you, you, your tire wear increases because you can't deliver the power smoothly. You can't set the car up in the same way. And, and they're the differences that, that's what it all gets down to basically it, it, it's simple as smooth and crunchy peanut butter <laughs> I love that analogy um, so look back to McLaren for 95 although of course Mansell Nigel Mansell was meant to be he was the big signing coming into that mm. year I mean did you were you a member of the McLaren team at the start of 95 or were you drafted in when the Mansell situation didn't work out uh, well <laughs> I was uh, so first and foremost, I was I was heading towards McLaren again because there was quite a bit of discussion going on. The timing kind of like increased with let's get a deal done because little did I know that at this stage there were some issues. But what actually happened with me was that Ron signed me again on a test contract for test driver money knowing already that I was going to be a race driver because I'm sure of it. He knew that that was going to be the case. <clears throat> and to this day, I still, you know, me and him have a little bit of a difference of opinion on, you know, if you, if you then took me on. And, and, and again, you know, some of it may be my mistake as well because I never envisaged, you know, never really looked at saying that I was going to be a race driver in a 1995 season because we had Mansell and Hacken in the car, you know, so it didn't really dawn on me that I really should be putting things in place to, if I did become a race driver, things would be quite different fiscally. So there was no difference to the money when you were drafted in? No. But in that little contract, you know, which wasn't a little contract, it was a big contract um, because it was from McLaren, was that sort of caveat that, you know, you could be drafted in to be a race driver at any point and da 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 So, uh, yeah, yeah. That one did grind on me. Yeah. And <laughs> as much as I went cap in hand trying to get a bit more money, I think, I'd have to check. I don't know whether Ron did give me a bit more money in the end. I've, I've, I've got a feeling he didn't, but... Um, Even when you got points? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need oh, no. to double really... check, Tom, but the, 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 the be yeah. on end all is, is that pretty much I was on test driver money and not race driver money. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, that wasn't one of my best negotiating parts. <laughs> but you were, I guess, you were a race driver for McLaren. You know, and they just started the partnership with Mercedes and... Yes, yeah, and so there were, uh, you know, again, given the role, the biggest bugbear I had with Ron at that time was that he put me on a race by race contract, so it sat over and above then on my test contract, but he wouldn't give me the concrete stability of saying that I was the driver for the rest of the season. At no point, or at just no earlier, point. At even no point. two thirds of the way through the at season. No point, and I argued with him. You know, and, and looking back at it now, and maybe maybe he would have time to reflect on it at some point, the reason behind that was twofold. One, it was to signal to the outside world that I was a bona fide McLaren driver, Grand Prix driver, and two, internally give everybody that understanding, yeah, because I had a, I had a lot of support internally and, and a lot of people were rooting for me. But thirdly, that he didn't get it. You know, and to this day, he still, I'm sure, didn't get it. I needed that security because I had a, a, a young boy at home with my, my wife, you know, still a young man in my own right, building a family. And I wanted that financial security. And that was with a, you know, a full on race contract. So all the while you say the likes of Patrick Head and Harvey Pottleswaite were great 
at motivating a driver and you wanted to do well for them, are you suggesting that Ron perhaps wasn't on the same wavelength? No, I, I, for, for me, you know, Ron's outlook was in his eyes, he felt that I performed better under pressure. And that pressure was, you're only in the car one race at a time. And I argued with him on the basis, look, that isn't how it works. I will perform way better knowing that I am here for the rest of the season. Just let me get on and get my job done. Not that I've got to keep like, you know, put in the, because in some ways for me, I found it actually a little bit detrimental. Because there were times when you think, oh, you know, what can I get stuck in here? Mm, if I make a mistake, maybe that's not really going to look too good and I won't be in for the next Grand Prix. Um, I do remember we were at uh, Estoril, where actually at Estoril I out-qualified Hakkinen. Bearing in mind that Hakkinen was the guy that out-qualified Senna. In 93, yeah, at Estoril. All right, and I did the same with Hakkinen. And I know then that overnight, Mika had his pedals changed over from left foot braking back to conventional because I always conventionally braked oh, and I never went to left foot braking. Just what less feel in your left foot? Or? I just, I was just confident with it and used to it. And I, and because I'd never done karting, I just didn't have that processing of mm. left and right and the pressures. And I just felt more confident. I think Rubens Barrichello was the same as me. Yep. And because I'd out qualified him, you know, bearing in mind, I knew also engine spec wise, he was a little bit better off than us. He, he, they had the pedals changed overnight and it kind of threw him a little bit of a loop but but I also know uh, you know that Grand Prix I was also asked to move over to let him go by and and that was based off of being told like if you don't do so then you're not going to be in the car again that was the pressures that you were under at that point you know and, and I look back at it now and there again I'm reflecting on if I'd have been a bit more selfish if I'd have actually taken no notice of that and gone for gold and disobeyed it, what may have been the outcome of that result as opposed to me, you know, basically doing what I was told. And Hakkinen at the time was very much recognised as, as one of the quickest guys on the grid, wasn't he? Even in 95 before he won a race and yeah. he was the real deal. Yeah, and, and you know, things like that, you know, when you, when you go and do what you, you do, I wasn't in a position to go and shout about it. It was, you know, I kind of had to sort of like, dumb down with it I just out qualified Hakkinen and Hakkinen out qualified Senna and there's your references and I, you know but kind of just got sort of put under the carpet a little bit like but in, just hoping that the people who needed to know knew and yeah had, I mean because you know it, it 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 you know you're only as good as your teammate at the end of the day that is your reference in F1 and, and it was it was quite a big thing and but it was it was also big internally because the people internally knew where we sat as I said, you know, I knew that where I was engine spec wise wasn't the same. And what we'd done on the day and what we pulled out the hat was pretty good. You know, I was proud of it. But I wanted <laughs> to really go and shout about it, you know. Really good, not just pretty good. Yeah, but yeah, but it, again, that's it's just yeah. part of the process. Yeah. Of the so process. how difficult was Adelaide that year? For, for people who can't remember, um, Mick Hakkinen had this horrendous accident. Mm -hmm. And how hard was it for you to carry on? Because, you know, it was marginal with Mika for quite a while. I'm guessing you were having to get back in the car, not knowing his health and his, his situation. Uh, you know, I, I, God's honest truth. It, it wasn't, it wasn't that difficult. And, and I'm saying that because I think if you ask any racing driver, they're all wired the same. We all, we all did what we did and do what we do because we want to, not because somebody's hitting us on top of the head saying you must go and drive a Grand Prix car. And, and with that is an acknowledgement that there's risk and the risk of loss of life, injury, loss of colleagues. Did you feel the same way about Ratzenberger and Senna the previous season as yeah, well? Yeah, I mean, listen, we, you, you know, I, I look back at my career and I think through all of the disciplines, I can pretty much get to about 12 guys who have been lost around me that I've known, you know, and known to a certain level. And... It's almost like there's a bit of a mutual respect between everyone that, you know, they would want you to carry on. Yeah, that's that's kind of the makeup of guys, you know, it's like, and don't get me wrong again, we, we kind of thrive on that danger element and pushing beyond the envelope. That's what makes you tick. But we are fully acknowledging that there is risk. And yes, we've lost one of our guys, but we're still going to go and do what we do because that's who we are. It's like, going, you know, Spitfire pilot. 
okay, guy's gone down and we've lost him, but still got to go and get the job done. Mm. You know, still got. Well, and you there. drove that amazing race in Adelaide as well in '95, yeah. finishing fourth. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it it really is. A, it's a strange one, Tom, and I think it's it's a. It may sound a bit cold and it may sound a bit callous, but it's it really is the makeup of guys that you know. We we have the acknowledgement of risk being there, and it's a risk that we choose to take. So, when something does happen, you know, I could have made a choice and said, "I'm not driving, I'm done." Lots of other people could have made the same choice, but we didn't. You're a fascinating mix, you racing drivers. Because I remember Derek Warwick saying that quite often he'd get home on a Sunday night and cry his eyes out. His words, not mine. Um, and yet, two weeks later, he'd be back in the car doing the same thing. Yeah, I, I, you know, we're still human. Mm. Um, we all have emotions. Mm. But I think we're quite good at putting them in boxes and putting them in areas where we can, you know, reduce the frequency that's going to affect us at some point and maybe at times when it does come out and we're in a different environment and maybe some of that does get released but you know at the end of the day like I say no one hit us on top of the crash helmet saying you must go and drive a racing car we were doing it through choice yes it was our job and yes we were paid to do so but that risk was always going to be there and you know it's something that you live with. And, and at the time when you decide that the risk is too high, that's the time you go and hang up the helmet and gloves anyway. Wow, Mark. Well, what an amazing chat. Just a couple more things. Um, I mean, there have been a, there were a few what ifs along the way, weren't there? If you could have done anything differently, is there one thing that stands out in Formula One? Oh, you know, if I'd have had a crystal ball, it would have come in very handy. Um, I think if I could have done something differently, I think, you know what, ultimately it would have been having a bit more self-belief. It, it would have actually been giving myself a platform to actually stand there and go, you know, no, I, I am as good as the guy next to me. I, I can do that because I've proven it. And maybe having the balls big enough to shout about it a bit more. Or maybe I needed somebody to shout for me. I don't know. I mean, but that's... That's something that I think was a bit costly for me career-wise. Did you ever have a manager? I mean, John McDonald teed up the early deals for you, but... I, I had a couple of guys that represented me, but they never represented me in, in a way that I felt comfortable with. And, and ultimately, they were, they were still not the right people because they still didn't have the, the network of contacts and, and also didn't sometimes maybe approach something in the right way because they didn't have the experience from within the sector. And, you know, because everyone's different and there's a time and a place and a way of going about some things. So some of that is a reason why I got into what I'm doing today. I'm, I don't know whether I'm any good at it. I know that I've got a track record in it now, but I will always maintain the same values of trust, loyalty and being a straight talker. And sometimes straight talking doesn't always get you where you want to be. But, you know, I put my head on the pillar every night and go to sleep and don't have any worries. I'd like to think long term being a straight talker works out in the end, doesn't it? I'd, I'd like to think so because it's always paid off for me. But at the same time, I think having relationships where I've been able to call upon them has, has been the way that I've gone through my career. And, you know, as I said to you at the beginning, I'm OK with that. I've not done too badly. Certainly not. And what about of the 61 races, best race? Oh... You know, I'm looking at the headline podiums, but actually, was there a race perhaps that didn't get you to the podium? Do you, do you know one of the best races I ever had was in the McLaren in 95 Japanese Grand Prix, where I didn't qualify because I had a humongous crash, had double vision, um, was allowed to get on the back of the grid, drove from the back of the grid, came six, actually should have been a bit higher up, but again, for some little bit of politics internally. Uh, but as, as a Grand Prix drive, it was one of my best. And uh, again, if you would to go and find some of the guys who were at McLaren at the time internally in the team, I think they would probably testify to that being one of the best Grand Prix that I'd ever did during the 95 season. Awesome. And of course, you're now a team boss. <laughs> <laughs> Just to fast forward it to the present. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm a team boss. I am sporting director one of those terms that didn't exist back in my, didn't exist back, back in my day, but um, of a British touring car team with my name over the door. And, and I'm very proud of it. 
Um, listen, it, it's just another, it's another chapter. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm getting to that point where I think there's a couple of other chapters still to do in, in my business life and also in a couple of other things that I want to achieve. Uh, and maybe at that stage I will actually sit down and do a book because everybody else has bloody done one and I haven't done it. So, you know, <clears throat> I've got to do one at some point. Um, but no, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I tapped into British Touring Cars last year, got my backside kicked, couldn't get on the front wheel drive, stepped away, loved it low, loved the environment, always a racer at heart and we're trying to approach it differently. Well, look, best of luck with that. Best of luck with the next chapters in your life and thank you very much for your time. That was great chat. Thank you. Just imagine if Mark had got that race seat at Williams in 93, how many F1 victories would sit alongside his name now? Careers can and often do turn on a sixpence in Formula One. But having said that, the fact that Mark didn't get to race for Williams added a depth of colour to his career that would surely make a good film. His fight back to a race seat was real boy's own stuff and it proved that grit and determination still account for much in this big money sport. And I love those stories about him and Brundle, the Brundell twins as they were known. It's a true Formula One bromance. Mark, thanks for your time. It was great to catch up. And thanks too to Joe for her help in freeing up your diary. Well, that's it for this week, but we'll be back in just seven sleeps with another great guest from the world of Formula One. In the meantime, if you want to drop me a message about the show, I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter, and you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Alex Griffin did just that after our podcast with Flavio Briatore last week. Fair to say that Flav was a controversial guest for many of you, though that didn't stop you listening. Alex said, Flavio Briatore blaming Damon Hill for the Adelaide crash with Michael Schumacher is as Flavio as you can get, really. Great job from Tom Clarkson for setting him straight-ish. Yeah, I could have pulled him back a bit straighter, Alex, but glad you enjoyed the chat and thanks for your feedback. That's about it for this week. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay safe, keep washing those hands, and keep it flat out. <laughs>